I'm not sure if this video is going to make it onto the channel as uh, I'm still uh, wondering if I'm being silenced on not just YouTube but on academia.edu. I tried to post a, another anthropology video on academia and I was denied. And uh, they didn't come right out and say I'm denied. They just said, error, try again. Over and over and over and over again. <coughs> so if you see this video, it's because I got the other one up. Uh, in dealing with critical thought as a Mormon, uh, Jeremy Runnels who uh, had been excommunicated from the church because of his CES letter. He wasn't asking questions. He was questioning the church. And there's different alterations of what used to be simple definitions of words as each new generation of teenagers alters the definitions of words. <clears throat> For example, in my grandparents' day, and maybe my parents, uh, there was the, the wording of being square. Square as a as a human behavior, it is weird in and of itself. But that's the definition of square. And so conspiracy theory, likewise, has been altered in its original meaning. And and even being critical has also taken on a more judgmental, which also has been changed condemning uh, meaning, uh, removing the innocent, neutral meaning that these words originally had. <clears throat> and so the, the church, by wanting us to ask questions but not question, what they're doing is not telling us that we can ask questions but they're using the other definition of uh, a doubt about the truth or validity of something or the raising of a doubt about or objection to something. And uh, Jeremy, uh, in his CES letter, has at the beginning of it or at least on his website, or, or uh, video of it, or something like that. Uh, a church leader who famously said, if the church can't stand up to criticism, the church uh, cannot be true. And of course I'm putting it into my own words, I'm not using the quote. I can see the guy's face that Jeremy was using, but I don't memorize. <clears throat> and so Mormons should doubt using that other definition of question. If the prophets are refusing to allow Mormons to ask questions, the church has caused this themselves. They're the ones who said, we will not answer your questions anymore. They're the leaders of the church. They're supposed to be the ones with the answers. They claim they communicate with Jesus. That everything they do is inspired by Jesus, and it's exactly what Jesus wants to have done. So when Brigham Young said, no more priesthood for blacks, it was Jesus who said, no more priesthood for blacks. 
when Brigham Young took away priesthood and priesthood office from women, it was Jesus who took away priesthood and priesthood office from women. The murdering of native indigenous people of the Salt Lake Valley, that was Jesus, according to Brigham Young. And so, yes, there are many reasons to doubt and object to the prophet's claims that Jesus is the one giving them the orders. But the prophets are the ones who have set up this scenario. <clears throat> you can't commit crime, for example, and claim it's Jesus to get away with it in the courts. Oh, sorry, religion. Jesus told us to do it. You have to give us our First Amendment rights. We're innocents. We are not crooks. And, and yet, other pressures have borne down on the prophets. As September 6th, we're finding out about the rock and a hat, uh, which was actually two rocks, you know, the Urim and Thummim. But the prophets have compromised and have allowed the narrative of the rock and a hat to proceed, <laughs> since the Gospel Topic Essays. Some, what, 30 years later? 20, well, 20, 20 years. It was 96, uh, or 93, 93, when September 6 occurred. And so, uh, it was around 2011, 2013, and so that would be 20 years. But uh, the church, in excommunicating and firing September 6, made a big enough deal in the church and out of the church. There were lots of doubters because of what the church did to silence them the September 6. Silencing people is a first indicator that something's wrong. <laughs> and I am one who knows all about being silenced. <laughs> and yet, the church is hoping you will be dumb enough to think that, well, that's because we're silenced because God wins. The truth wins because we've silenced our enemy. It's not how it works. In the field of logical argument, and debate is supposed to be the place to develop a, uh, a logical discussion and avoiding of fallacy arguments. Uh, but debate, as I've come to learn, has not been focused on that. As junior high kids, for example, get a participation point if they use fallacy. And you can't allow fallacy at all. Don't give them a participation point for it. But our society, not just within the Mormon church, has developed a fallacy mindset. We're not critical anymore. We're accusatory. We just throw out accusations of some at somebody or some group and uh, just try to see what sticks. And if something sticks, we go, ah, we triggered you. <laughs> That's our culture now. It's the cancel culture. It's the Me Too movement culture. It's even the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that uh, have have strayed in that people came in purposely to destroy it. As uh, many examples uh, during 2020 uh, illustrated, 
that you had people from white supremacist groups join the Black Lives Matter protests so that they could blame the protesters for the violence and the looting that occurred. <coughs> and the Me Too movement was shut down because of that same thing. You had people joining the movement to destroy it, making false accusations to ruin innocent people's lives. And that's what shut it down. And council culture is is uh, still continuing though with uh, TikTok, I guess is what it is. But I'm victimized by it by the algorithm that YouTube uses, <coughs> which is not a mass thing. It's a a, a leadership thing like the church. And so when the church passes the buck to the stake presidents, and the stake presidents obviously don't have the answers, they have the handbook, which the church has now released to the public. And so Mormons no longer need to ask any questions because they're all there? No, they're not. <coughs> the handbook does not have those answers. And so the church purposely is not answering basic questions that should be asked by a religion. And that, of course, raises doubts. Why aren't they able to answer this? Has Jesus not communicated with them? They claim the first vision is real, but I have questions about the first vision and the prophets won't answer them, and my stake president is clueless and the handbook has nothing on it, why won't the prophets give us the answers to the questions that are desperately needed? Because if the church is true, there's no reason to withhold the information. This isn't a government, there's no national security involved. It's just our relationship with God. And the church just refuses to answer the questions. And then they condemn Mormons and order Mormons not to go beyond what the church prints, what the church gives in conference, what the church has in the manuals. And yet, the scriptures are what the source of all the questioning comes from. As the Joseph Smith history is in Mormon scripture, as canon. And yet the prophets refuse to answer the questions that are posed in scripture. And they'll brush it off by saying you have to have faith, you can't doubt, you can't question. But the doctrine of Mormonism in regards to obtaining knowledge and intelligence, light and truth, is the scientific process of vegetation. You have a seed, Alma 32 says, we'll liken that unto a word, you know, a precept, as the introduction to the Book of Mormon uh, tells us. The precepts are the most correct and will help us draw nearer to God. So if that's true, you have to first find a precept, that's the seed, plant it in your life, and see what the fruit develops from it. And so, uh, going through the Book of Mormon looking for precepts, as to how to do this. We have some story examples, like Nephi building a boat. He gets revelation. Okay, build a boat. You're going to go to another new promised land. We're doing another Exodus pattern in the Book of Mormon. Build a boat. Just 
was like Noah, which also is the example in Hebrews chapter 11, which first defines faith. And then gives examples to explain the definition. So if you cut out the rest of the passage, whether it's in the Book of Mormon, Alma chapter 32, starting verse 28, or in Hebrews 11 and 1, you're going to be clueless as to how to do this process. Uh, if you don't make the connection in the stories. And so with Noah and with Nephi, they both needed to have the tools to build the boat according to the blueprints they got in their mind. And, uh, and the result was the boat. Was it good or was it bad? Well, in both examples, it was good. That's how you know the revelation was good. The seed is good if the fruit is good. If the fruit is bad, the seed was bad. <clears throat> it's a simple, basic physics principle that uh, you can't produce consequences magically or creatio ex nihilo. But the church does not teach this. They don't want Mormons to go through this process. Because when Mormons do, say for example, the scriptures say, look for the signs of the second coming, or of the latter days. And so Mormons see it blood moon tetrad in 2014-2015 and uh, uh, they're wondering, they're asking questions, is this the latter day signs? Because the moon's supposed to turn to blood, the moon's turning to blood. Oh, we now have three apostles who died, Harry, Packer, and Scott. Is this it? Church comes out and says no. If you didn't know, Hinckley, in 2001, came out with a conference talk in which he said that the prophecies of Joel have been all fulfilled. Sun shall be darkened, moon turned to blood, stars fall from heaven. That already happened? Well, what happened to Adam on Diamond's priesthood meeting, the return to Zion, the building of the temple, the war in Jerusalem, what's going on? Some There's some questions we have. Because <laughs> none of those happened. So what's going on? They weren't fulfilled. Hinkley lied to us. And now you're saying that when these signs are appearing, that they're not the signs, and that they still have yet to occur in the future. And so therefore Hinckley was wrong. Nobody thinks about that, because the church shuts people down immediately. And so it's not just with church history that uh, the church does not want critical thought. It's all things Mormonism that the church does not want Mormons to be critical with. And so as you've watched Nelson take away half of the Sunday school year, you know, it's every other week, or every, yeah, every other week for the lessons, and then priesthood and release society have likewise alternating with the Sunday school and so the educational 
system for Mormons is being cut back. And the prophets still have yet to translate the Bible correctly for Mormons. The prophets still have yet to bring back what they took away. We're supposed to get more scripture, not have it taken away from us. Well, the prophets can just simply say, well, Mormons are wicked, so we took it away, that which they had. Quoting the scripture. And when you quote scripture, rather than put it in your own words, you know you're brainwashed. Or trying to brainwash others. So, for example, judge not lest you be judged, and the beam and the moat from Matthew... I, if you just quote that, you can't judge me. Judge me not, lest you be judged. You haven't learned anything. All you're doing is parroting a portion that benefits you in the circumstance. Because having experienced it myself, and having gained understanding from my experience, I now put that passage of scripture into my own words by telling you guys that which you falsely accuse in another reveals the same and worse fault in yourself. That's how critical thought is supposed to develop in our minds. That we take a precept, implement it, develop a theory test that we can test it to find out if it's true or false. And then, once we find out it's true, we're able to explain it in our own words. Now, yes, it is true. Because the seed does not look like the fruit. But the fruit contains seed for more fruit. And so, I guess this was a quicker video than I thought it would be, um, but uh, Mormons should doubt the church, the prophets, when they withhold information, when they cover up, when they deceive, when they lie. It doesn't make you the bad guy, as they tell you you are. They are exposed as the bad guys. Don't let them redefine words. So, uh, that's a, a curious anthropological behavior of the prophets and the Mormons reaction to it as the three million Mormons who are left in the church as 13 million have said I want nothing more to do with it I'm not going anymore I'm out and they have to hide because the church hunts them down because <laughs> of the membership record information <coughs> and uh, think that Mormons would realize what's going on, but when you listen to them, they parrot, and so you know they've been brainwashed, that they do not know the answer, and can only quote the quick, simple answer to get people off their back as they suppose. And all it does is expose them as not knowing the answer and trying to claim that we have to accept it by faith alone rather than finding out the fruits. And so if you can't produce anything from a seed, that also tells you it's a bad seed. 
just like in a theory. If you cannot have a test to find out if it's true or false, you have to dismiss the theory because it's never going to give you your answer. It's a simple concept, but with so much misinformation and disinformation, many people are falling victim to the lies and deceptions that are going on, not just in the church, but in society as a whole as well.